Good evening and welcome to our program. This series is focusing on This Is Your FBI. This Is Your FBI was a radio crime drama which aired in the United States on ABC from April 6, 1945 to January 30th, 1953 for a total of 409 shows. The show featured true cases from the FBI and was told from an FBI agent's viewpoint. FBI Chief J. Edgar Hoover gave it his endorsement, calling it our show and calling it the finest dramatic program on the air. Generally, I do not include advisories. Given Hoover's polarizing nature, I will share this. Dramatized stories created for propaganda purposes are not history. They tell one biased side of the story, and in no way am I saying that these are reliable stories. I just believe them to be interesting when viewed through the scope of entertainment and weird history. Finally, I'd like to send a specific thank you to publicdomainreview.org and archive.org for organizing and compiling all of this media. If you would like to listen to standalone media, we have included a link in the description. The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This is Your FBI. <laughs> This is your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. Are you one of the 47 million Americans who benefit from group insurance? Listen carefully to this special message from Mr. Charles R. Hook, president of the American Rolling Mill Company. Mr. Hook says, In 1917, our company became the first company in the entire steel industry to provide our men and women with the protection of group life insurance. We considered it an investment to increase productivity by reducing worry. Today, all sound industrial relations programs include group life insurance. I wish time permitted me to describe to you just how much it has meant to the many, many families whose provider has passed away during the past 30 years. It would prove to you, as it has to us, the great value of group life insurance. Yes, group insurance is something worth owning. In 14 minutes, the Equitable Life Assurance Society will give further important information about group insurance for both employers and employees. Tonight's FBI file, The Honest Embezzler. Not every one of the more than a million and a half crimes that are committed each year in the United States is important enough to be the subject of banner headlines in your local newspaper. But every crime that violates a federal statute is important enough to be the subject of intense work by every division of your FBI. Sometimes that work is not immediately rewarded. Sometimes the criminal is cautious enough to escape the net prepared for him. But to the FBI, no file is marked closed until the criminal is found. Whether that task takes six weeks, six months, or six years. Tonight's file opens on the grounds of a carnival that's playing in a Midwestern city. In a small tent located behind one of the main attractions on the Midway, we find one of the performers, Lily Fenton, resting on a canvas cot. Fenton. Yeah? May, may I come in? That you, Pop? Yeah. Yeah, come ahead. Brought you over a pail of coffee. Well, thanks, Pop. A little nip in the air this evening. I I thought you might catch a chill. You're wonderful. <laughs> Tell me something, Pop. What? What's that? How's a nice old guy like you to come to be with a carny? Well, after Lily died... Lily? That was my wife's name, too. No kidding. 
When she died, I just couldn't stand the house anymore. I, I saw her sitting in every chair. Oh. Here, cut up some of this coffee, will you? No, no, thanks. I, I, I'd better get back to my job. Come on. Well, Here. all right, thanks. Now I know why you're always so nice to me. Well, I'll tell you, Miss Penton. Why don't you call me Lily? No, I couldn't do that. I couldn't call anybody else Lily. Oh, I'm sorry. Forgive me. That's all right. You're a real nice girl, Miss Penton. Thanks, Pop. I wish I really were your Pop. I wouldn't let you work here. Oh, this isn't as bad as it looks. The dough's good when business is good. It's good tonight, isn't it, Pop? Yes, yes, very good. Well, it'll still suit me to get out of this town. Too many squares. Hmm? Uh, squares? Yokel. Oh. Still having trouble with Carney talk, huh, Pop? Well, I, I'm i gradually catching on. Well, don't get too hep. I like you better this way. Hi, Lily. Oh, hello, Marty. What are you doing here, Pop? He's well, visiting. Why? Who's taking tickets? Uh, Bob relieved me for a few minutes. I was just going back. Look, finish your coffee. Don't let this guy scare you. No, I'd really better go. Uh, thanks for the visit. Come back any time, Pop. Yes, thank you. Marty, I don't want you to treat Pop like that. Huh? You practically chased him out of here. So what? He's a nice old guy. He's also a scared old guy. What do you mean? He's a lone wolf. Listen, baby, I've been around Carney's long enough to know that kind is on the lam from something. Oh, stop. Honey, I know. Look at the way he talks, the way he dresses. He could be doing something better than taking tickets with a tent show. Look, for once in your life, will you mind your own business? I just got a yen to find out about him. Marty, lay off. Okay, baby. Whatever you say. In an FBI office several hundred miles from the carnival grounds, Special Agent Jim Taylor has been given a case which will eventually lead him to that carnival. Hi there, Jim. Oh, oh hello, Ralph. I thought you were still upstate on that Monroe case. No, we cleaned that one up. I got back last night. What are you working on? Some unfinished business. Oh? Yes, I'm looking for a man named Earl Corey. He was teller at the National Bank. Yes? Disappeared about six months ago. When they examined his books, they found a shortage of over $9,000. Was this just reported? No, we've had a file on it right along. It's just been handed to me. Those are always tough ones. Well, this one's no exception. Any leads at all? Not a one. What's the background on this man, Corey? Well, he was 62 years old. Had been married. Wife died shortly before he disappeared. I see. He lived here all his life. No police record. He'd been with the bank over 30 years. Any motive for the embezzlement? Well, his wife had been ill for several years. He evidently had used the bank funds to cover doctor bills, and then when she died, he ran away. That was foolish. Yes, I know. Would have been far better for him to have stayed and faced the charges. What about relatives or friends? No. They've heard nothing from him. Well, where do you go from here? Well, I've just been playing a little game. A game called, if I were Mr. Corey, what would I do? <laughs> Any results? Nothing sensational, but I do know this. If I'd been a man of regular habits, as Mr. Corey was, and I'd lived here all my life, I think I'd be curious to know what was happening back in my hometown. That makes sense. Now, as far as we know, he hasn't corresponded with anyone. So the logical source of information would be one of our local newspapers. Which he might have had sent to him? That's right. So I'm making the rounds of the papers this afternoon to check up on all out-of-town subscribers. Need any help, Jim? No, not yet, Ralph. This is really just a shot in the dark. If it doesn't work, I'll start off again in another direction. you're not working this show? My contract says I take off one show a day. This is it. Well, who's on out there? Daisy. Oh, that's kind of a tired routine. And what's with all the clothes? The word came in. Dress up or we're sloughed. Oh. By the way. Yeah? 
I saw Pop a while ago. He's very grateful for what you did. What was that? Finding his wallet. Oh, well, that was nothing. I just happened to be walking along the midway, looked down. Stop, and... will you? Huh? Who are you kidding? What do you mean? The only reason you returned that wallet is because you had somebody lift it in the first place. Uh, what would I want with that old geezer's pokey? So you could dig who he really is. Now, wait a minute. Marty, what? don't lie to me. I can always peg it, see? Okay, so I did have it lifted. And? And I was right about him. He gave us a phony handle. His real name is Corey. He used to be a bank teller back in Cleveland. So? So no guy leaves a job like that to take tickets in a carney unless he got in a jam. What difference does that make to you? Honey, it could make a real big difference. How? If he dipped his duke in the till before he left that bank, he could have a bundle buried someplace. If he had a bundle, he wouldn't be working here. Look, them Lamisters do funny things sometimes. He might just be waiting to cool off. And this is a real good spot to do it. Marty, I want you to leave him alone. Now, look, baby, I got a pal in Cleveland. I could have him check up on a guy. If he did take that bank, we could make a real good score. Pop left that job because his wife died. If you try to blow a whistle on him, so help me, I'll fix you good. Jim. Oh, Jim. Oh, hello, Ralph. Going back to the office? Yes. Hop in, I'll give you a lift. Fine, thanks. Got a lead on that bank embezzler, didn't you? Yes, how did you know? <laughs> I could tell by the way you were walking down the street you were about two feet off the pavement. <laughs> well, it was that hundred to one shot that came through, Ralph. You got it from one of the newspapers? That's right. I checked subscriptions for the past six months. I'm practically positive that the handwriting on one of them is Corey's. I'll have it confirmed in the lab. Where is he? Oh, right now he's in Fort Wayne, Indiana. Any address? No, he received the papers care of general delivery. Well, you could have a surveillance set up at the post office there and pick him up. I don't think that would work in Fort Wayne. Why not? Well, beginning tomorrow, his address will be Lansing, Michigan. He'll be there for a week. I see. Whatever he's doing, he's really been on the move. He spent exactly one week in a whole succession of cities. Did you get a list of these places? Yes. Well, that'll be a help in determining what sort of work he's doing. Now, I know. But I don't think I'll have to dig into that. I have an idea they'll pick up Mr. Corey at the general delivery window in Lansing. How do you like that? What's the matter, Lily? Oh, hiya, Marty. Come on in. What's the beef, kid? I got a hundred more miles to travel on this train, so I settle down here in this compartment for a nice evening of solitaire, and what happens? I win the very first game. <laughs> Is uh, that a box of candy there? Yeah, help yourself. Okay. Pop give it to you? He did. Why don't you two go steady? I might be better off with him than with you. I hope you did like I told you. You mean about laying off the guy? Yeah. Baby, I'm leaving him strictly alone. Good. Oh, uh, by the way, where is Pop? Back in the baggage car. He turned in. Oh. Want to play some gin? No, I don't think so, honey. I'm kind of restless. I think I'll go out on the platform and grab a smoke. Okay. See you later, huh? Mm-hmm. Ah, not now, Joe. Later, maybe. Hiya, Pop. Huh? Oh, uh, hello, Mr. Burns. Got you packed in with the baggage, huh? Oh, I don't mind that. Nice and lonely in here, huh? Yes. You like to be alone, don't you? Sometimes. You smoke? No, thanks. I have my pipe. Okay. Pop. Yes? Something I want to talk to you about. Well? About that wallet you lost. Oh? 
According to an identification card that was in it, your real name is Corey, and you used to be a bank teller in Cleveland. Now, look, Mr. Burns. Let me finish. I talked on a phone this afternoon to a pal of mine who lives in Cleveland. You see, I figured it was worthwhile finding out why you changed your name and hooked up with a carny. Now, see here, My I... My pal called me back and gave me the answer. Seems you left the bank owing him a little. About $9,000. Is that right? Yes. That's a lot of potatoes, Pop. Where you got it stashed? I haven't got it. Huh? I spent every cent of it. Now, wait a minute. That's the truth, Mr. Burns. I took that money only because my wife was desperately ill. Every cent went for her doctor bills. When she died, well, instead of doing what was right and confessing my guilt, I I ran away. Look, lay off the hearts and flowers, will you? Where's the dough? I just told you. And, Mr. Burns, I'm glad you found me out. I'm sick and tired of running away. I... I want you to turn me in. Who cares about turning you in? I want that nine grand. Now stop giving me them routines and get it up. I swear to you, I haven't got it. What's in that little bag? Huh? What? what? That one there. Anything besides your clothes? I haven't got the 9000 All I've got in this bag is $200. I saved it to make partial restitution to the bank. Let me see. No, you keep away from oh, that. let now. go of me, you will you? keep away, I Why said. You? I do what you do. <laughs> now we'll see what's in the bag. Ah, you were telling the truth. All right, Pop, what have you really got to do? Answer me. Come on, eh? Pop. Holy. We will return in just a moment to tonight's file, which shows how your FBI protects national security. Now let's hear from a typical American worker who has attained greater personal security. It sure was a red-letter day when the boss signed up for complete group insurance protection. Man works better when he's got peace of mind. Well, you certainly get plenty of peace of mind from complete group coverage, for that takes in life insurance, accident and sickness insurance, and a retirement income, plus hospital, medical, and surgical benefits for yourself and your wife and children. All in one package from the Equitable Life Assurance Society. And no medical examination to get it. One thing stumps me, though. It's how little that package costs. Well, your employer pays a part of the cost. Also, since he employs a number of workers, you get the benefit of what you might call the wholesale price for insurance. It sure was a bargain for me last winter. A bad case of the flu really had me down. Doc Brady even had my chest x-rayed. Those bills would have set me back for a long time. But they were all paid for by my group insurance. You know, group insurance was originated by the Equitable Life Assurance Society in 1911. Thomas I. Parkinson, president of the Equitable Society, says, group insurance is the most inspiring life insurance development of our time. If your company does not have group insurance, or if your company's group program is incomplete, your management can get in touch with the nearest Equitable Life Assurance Society office. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. The Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. And now, back to the FBI file, The Honest Embezzler. The law, as we have molded it in 170 years, is not an impersonal, harsh set of rules written by vindictive men. It has compassion, and the quality of its mercy is available to all. Running away is the foolhardy course, for, as tonight's case from the files of your FBI proves, 
The cloak of justice affords more warmth, even to the criminal. Tonight's file continues at the Cleveland field office the day after the brutal slaying of the elderly bank embezzler on the carnival train. FBI Special Agent Jim Taylor is just sitting down at his desk when... Uh, Jim, I've been looking for you. Well, what about, Ralph? The resident agent up in Lansing phoned while you were out. Yes. He did as you asked him. He set up a surveillance at the general delivery window at the post office, but so far, no results. Mm-hmm. The local police are cooperating with him. They checked hotels, rooming houses, tourist camps, but no one of Corey's description has turned up. Well, I think I have a good lead. On where to find Corey? Yes. Now, as you know, he stayed in 20 cities for exactly one week at a time. Yes. Well, I did some research on what possible type of work would take him to each of those places. And what'd you come up with? A traveling carnival. So? Their playing dates coincided with each place that Kerry had had his newspaper sent. That should cinch it, then. I would think so, yes. Are you going up to Lansing? No, I'm sure the resident agent there can handle it. I'll get him on the phone, give him the name of the carnival. Then it should be just a matter of going out there and picking up Mr. Corey. <laughs> Yeah, I took a part of huh? Marty, what happened to him? Well, how should I know? Did you scare him away? Oh, now, wait, baby. I gave you my word I'd lay off the guy, didn't I? Yeah. Well, I kept it. Honest? Of course. But I probably wanted to move on, it's all. Oh, still awful funny. Look, kid, you're on in a couple of minutes. You better get backstage. <laughs> Any word from Lansing, Jim? Yes, Ralph, and it isn't good. What happened? Well, our resident agent went out to the grounds. He talked to the owner. Yes? He was told a man answering to Corey's description had worked with the show. He'd been a ticket taker at one of the attractions, but he suddenly disappeared. Yeah, that sounds pretty convenient. Yes, I know. However, some of the other employees around the show verify the story. You think they could be covering for him? That's possible, yes. Under what circumstances did he disappear? Well, he took the special train with the rest of the troop from Fort Wayne. Uh -huh. Seems that he slept in the baggage car. But when the show arrived in Lansing, he was gone. Now, of course, he could have gotten off any place along the route. What stops did the train make? Well, that's being checked now. Well, Jim, where do you go from here? Well, I've just been figuring that. I think I may have the answer. What is it? Corey was a ticket taker for one of the shows, so his job must be open now. Yes? I'm going to see if I can get permission from the boss to go up to Lansing and apply for his position. And do some inside work? Right. Our resident agent can't do that. They already know him up there now. You ever been around a carnival, Jim? Well, when I was in college, I worked for a circus during summer vacation. <laughs> Trapeze artist? No. <laughs> Peanut vendor. <laughs> but that should be background enough for me to find out all I want to know. Special Agent Hunter. Hello, Ralph. This is Taylor. Hello there, Jim. You up in Lansing? Yep, and I got the job. I'm now head ticket taker for a little attraction that features none other than Princess Lily, the flame dancer, and Dolores, the Sultan's favorite. But so Jim, far, I'm in a... I was just going to try to contact you. What for, Ralph? You can stop looking for Mr. Corey. What do you mean? His body was found beside the railroad tracks about 60 miles outside of Fort Wayne. So? Well, I guess this trip was a waste of time. I'm not so sure that it was. Why not? From the preliminary information that we've received, there's a suspicion that Corey might have been murdered. Really? Yes. From the condition of Corey's body and the position in which it was found, the medical examiners say it's very possible Corey was dead before he left the train. Ralph, did you have any money on him? Only a dollar and 20 cents in change. Well, that makes it look like robbery. Right. And if Corey was robbed, that would put the case under FBI jurisdiction. Well, as long as I'm on the grounds, I'll stay on, see what I can dig up. Right. Where do you think you'll start? 
Well, his best friend with this show was a woman called Princess Lily. I think I'll start by talking to her. Well, Miss Fenton? Yeah? May I come in? Oh, you. Yeah, come on in. I understand this goes with my job. What's that? Bringing you coffee. Oh, thanks. Old Pop used to do this, didn't he? That's right. That's too bad about him, isn't it? You mean he's leaving the show? No. No, about his body being found. What are you talking about? Oh, haven't you heard? No. Well, one of the boys out front just told me. He was found beside the railroad tracks about 60 miles outside of Fort Wayne. Oh, no. Yeah. According to the story I heard, they seem to think he was murdered. Murdered? Yes. The FBI's working on the case right now. I knew it. What did you say? Nothing. Ellie. Yeah. Look, honey, I... Oh, I didn't know you had company. Look, uh, you, will you clear out of here? I want to talk to Marty alone. Sure. We'll get moving, will you, Mac? Okay. Glad you got rid of him, honey. I wanted... Marty. Yeah? I just heard something about Pop. No kidding. His body was found by the railroad tracks out of Fort Wayne. His body? That's right. Oh, that's tough. Poor old guy. Save that. What do you mean? You told me you hadn't bothered Pop, that you'd let him alone. That's right. You said you weren't going to dig up why he left that bank in Cleveland. I didn't. You're a liar. What? You got a telegram about an hour ago. It was from your pal in Cleveland. How do you know? Because I opened it and read it. You had no right to do that. So I read it anyway. He wanted to know what luck you had with the information he gave you. That was on an entirely different matter. Don't give me that. You went to Pop on that train, didn't you? You told him what you knew about him. You know you're crazy? No, no, I know how you operate. If Pop was murdered, you're the one that gave it to him. Cut out that talk. Well, you're not going to get away with it. The FBI is on the case, and I'm going to go and tell them the whole story. You want? I'm going to give them the whole rundown on you and Pop right from the beginning. You ain't telling nothing. Let go of me. Shut up. No! Leave her alone, Burns. What? Let go of her. Keep out of this. Okay, mister, if that's how you want it. She doesn't have to go to the FBI, Burns. The FBI is here. I'm a special agent. What? Now, miss, suppose you tell me that story. Martin Burns was tried and convicted of murder in the state of Michigan and was sentenced to life imprisonment. Stated as simply as possible, tonight's case from the files of your FBI offers merely another proof that crime does not pay. That statement has been repeated by your FBI at every opportunity through every medium at their disposal since the Bureau was first founded. But for some strange reason, strange because Americans are an adaptable people, the self-evident proof that crime can never be made a profitable career has been ignored. Ignored to such an extent that in the first six months of this year, there were 28% more murders in this country than in the first six months of 1945. But as the number of crimes has risen, so has the number of convictions. Convictions that came about because of alert police work by local police departments, state law enforcement officers, and your FBI. In just a moment, we'll tell you about next week's exciting case from the official files of your FBI. Now, one last word to business executives. Since group insurance was originated by the Equitable Life Assurance Society 35 years ago, thousands of employers have learned that group insurance means satisfied workers, builds loyalty and morale, decreases labor turnover, improves quality and quantity of production. Get all the facts and figures from an Equitable Society group insurance expert. Whether your employees are entirely uninsured or have only partial protection, get in touch with the nearest office or write direct to the New York home office of the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. (laughs) 
Next week, we will bring you another colorful story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, The Fixed Election. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight's broadcast was directed by William M. Sweets. The music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. Your narrator was Dean Carlton. This is your FBI, is written and produced by Jerry Devine. This is Milton Cross speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States will bring you the fixed election on This Is Your FBI. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This Is Your FBI. <laughs> This is your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. Are you one of the 47 million Americans who benefit from group insurance? Listen carefully to this special message from Mr. Francis B. Davis, Jr., chairman of the board of directors of the United States Rubber Company. Mr. Davis says, and we quote, We deeply regret losing an employee, but we are glad to be able to help in easing the financial burden on his family through group life insurance. What will happen to my family if? That's a worry that troubles every husband and father. Our company's answer to that universal if is group insurance and peace of mind. Yes, group insurance is something worth owning. In 14 minutes, the Equitable Life Assurance Society will give further important information about group insurance which will interest both employers and employees. Tonight's FBI file, The Big Shakedown. When the last United States Census was taken, there were 300,000 people in this country who gave their address as prison. What made those people criminals? How had they become different than the ordinary law-abiding citizen who does his job and goes his way? The answers to those questions are not simple. But it can be said that the criminal does have two characteristics that outweigh all others. The first is greed. The overwhelming desire to get something for nothing. The second is ego. The ability of the criminal to believe that he is smart enough to get away with any crime, be that crime robbery, larceny, forgery, auto theft, or even murder. Tonight's file opens in the library of one of our state prisons. The custodian of this book-filled room, an inmate named Lawton, is seated behind a desk. A second prisoner enters. How are you today, Mr. Lawton? Oh, hello, Chick. Here's that last book I borrowed. I, I finished it. Well, good for you. You know something? That's the most pages I ever read in my life. You should feel justly proud. Thanks. Hey, uh, what's this I hear about you? What do you mean? You're getting out of here. Oh, yes, I'm leaving day after tomorrow. Gee, I'm sorry to hear that. You're what? Oh, I <laughs> I didn't mean about your getting out. That, that part's swell, but we'll miss you around here, that's all. I appreciate that, Jake. You know, you're the only guy in this whole joint with real class. Thank you. Mr. Lawton, tell me something, will you? Yes. 
This touch you got sent away for, extortion, wasn't it? That's right. What's the game on that? Why do you ask? Well, I guess maybe books have changed me. You see, I kind of got ambitious to be more than just a guy heisting delicatessen. That's most commendable. To tell you the truth, Mr. Lawton, I... I want to be a guy like you. <laughs> That's very flattering, Chief. Uh, I mean it. Y you see, I, I get out of here in a month myself. Maybe there's some way we could get together then, huh? Well, I... I I'd work for you for nothing at first, just to learn the business. Not so loud, Chief. Not so loud. Oh. Well, what do you say, Mr. Lawton? You mean, will I take you on? Yeah. When you're released, Chick, get in touch with me. Just a minute. Yes? Hello. Well? Does uh, Mr. Lawton live here? Who are you? My name is Chick Pelly. Uh, who are you? I'm Mrs. Lawton. What did you want with him? Well, him and I were up... That is, we were both in... Look, just let me see the guy, will you? He, he asked me to come here. Okay. Wait a minute. George. Well? There's a character at the front door with a very loose lower lip. He says you ask him to come here. What's his name? Pelly. Chick Pelly. Oh, of course. Chick and I were away together. Nice company you kept. Grace, darling, the state prison is hardly a gentleman's club. What's this business about you asking him to come here? Well, Mr. Pelly is a very ambitious young man. He wants to get into the higher criminal brackets. In fact, he wishes to serve as my apprentice. Your apprentice? That's right. Look, what's got into you? What? Ever since you got out of prison, you've sat around here doing absolutely... Darling, for your edification, I've been in action since the day I got home. What? But inasmuch as I work with my brain and not with my hands, I can't show you any material results. Look, all I Let know is... Let me finish, please. I have a setup that's been ready for a week. The reason I haven't moved with it is because I've been waiting for Mr. Chick Pelly. Oh, no. So send him in, Grace. Look... I said send him in. Okay. Mr. Pelly? Yeah? Mr. Lawton will see you now. Thanks. Right in there. Okay. How are you, Mr. Lawton? Hello there, Chick. Well, I headed right here for your place as soon as I got out. I'm glad you did, Chick. I've been waiting for you. Huh? I've decided to take you on as a pupil. Hey, that's swell. You will start at once. Yeah, but I... I don't know much about extortion. Well, its basic principle is the gathering of little-known facts about people. Facts they would rather not have revealed. Uh -huh. The standard practice is to send a letter to the person you have something on and request payoff for not divulging the information. And then backing your request by sterner action, if necessary. Uh -huh, yeah. I have such prospect in mind. His name is William Graham. And as your first lesson, Chick, you're writing him a letter. <laughs> Yes, dear? Aren't you coming up to bed? Well, I... No, not just yet, dear. You go on ahead. William, what's the matter? Well, not a thing. I don't believe you. You didn't eat a bite of dinner, and you sat around all night just staring at his face. What's wrong? Well, I guess there's no point in keeping it from you. I received a letter today. Yes? It was sent anonymously. It had no signature. What was it about? Something that my father did years ago. Something I thought no one knew about. I see. The letter writer knew, of course, that I'm running for office in this election. He's asking $10,000 to keep the matter quiet. Good heavens. Martha, I, I don't know what to do. There's only one thing to do. That's blackmail, extortion. You should turn the letter over to the police. I don't see how I can. Why not? If this matter were made public, it would have a great effect on my election. I know it would. But is the election that important? That's what I'm trying to decide. Oh, William, you can't. Please, you... dear, you run on to bed. This is a decision I must make by myself.
George. Yes, Gray? Your pupil is here again. Oh, fine. Send him in, will you? Okay. Go ahead in, genius. Thanks. Hiya, Mr. Lawton. Hello, Chick. Well, did you see this afternoon's paper? Yes. The guy took the ad in the personal column just like I told him to do in the letter. I know. I saw it. Well, that means he wants to do business, huh? I would think so, yes. What's my next move, Mr. Lawton? You send him a second note. Tell him to put the 10000 in a package. Okay. All bills of small denomination. Right. Then have him get in his car with the package and drive out to Oakland Cemetery. Tell him to park right in front of the soldier's memorial. Uh-huh. And then what? Then you say he's to get out of the car, yes. leave the package, walk out to the main gate. And unless he does, the details of his father will be given to his opponent. And we'll deal with him in a manner not conducive to his good health. And then if he follows instructions, I grab the package out of the car and blow, eh? Exactly. Gee, Mr. Lawton, every guy should have a teacher like you. Sit down, Mr. Graham. Thank you, Mr. Taylor. Now, what can I do for you? Did the chief of police call you? Yes, I've been expecting you. He told me that your story would be of interest to us here at the FBI. You know about the extortion note? Yes. Oh, may I see it, please? Of course. Here. Thank you. My husband doesn't know I'm coming here. In fact, he doesn't know I have the letter. I understand. The night he received it, I asked him to turn it over immediately to the police. But, well, the election is so important to him and all. He wanted time to think it over. This was a week ago? Yes. This morning he received a second letter. I know this because I recognize the handwriting. Yes. Well, go on. As soon as he read it, he left the house. I have a feeling, Mr. Taylor, that he was on his way to pay the money. Where is this second note? My husband took it with him. Well, that undoubtedly told him where to leave the money. Have you tried to locate your husband today? Yes. I couldn't find Did him. Did you check to see if he'd gone to the bank? No. Well, we'll get on that at once. Uh, Mr. Taylor. Yes? I, I know I've betrayed my husband's trust in coming here. Not at all, Mrs. Graham. You've done him a great service. I just hope you're not too late. Grace? Yeah? What time is it? Um, almost 4.30. Chick should be getting here by now. If he's coming back at all. What do you mean? Well, $10,000 is a lot of money. <laughs> Don't worry, my dear. I trust the boy completely. There, you see? That must be him now. Uh, let him in, please, Grace. Look, all I do around Answer here anymore... Answer the door. Okay. Hiya, Mrs. Lawton. Hello. Look, I got the dough. Well, come in. Thanks. Well, everything went Okay. Good for you, Chick. Here's the package. Splendid. You see, I already tore the paper and looked inside. There's real dough in there, all right. Grace, open it up and count it, please. Okay. Well, what do you think of your pupil now, Mr. Lawton? From my standpoint, Chick, you've done a most excellent job. Thanks. You wrote the two letters. You mailed them. You also collected the money. That's right. However, from your standpoint, I'd say it didn't turn out so well. What do you mean? Well, you were a little careless when you wrote those letters. The chances are you left a few fingerprints. But you didn't tell me to look out for that. I know. There's also a very strong likelihood that you were seen when you took the money from the car. Hey, what... What is this? I'm just pointing out the mistakes you made. If the authorities are called in on this, they'll undoubtedly pick you up. Mrs. Lawton, what... What is he saying? What I hoped he'd say right from the beginning. Huh? That you were stupid enough to let him use you. Now, wait a minute. You I wanted to learn, Chick. But I didn't want to be framed. I neglected to tell you that was part of the lesson. Oh, you dirty... Stay where you are. Put down that gun. Sorry, Chick. Mr. Lord! Gray? I'd say he's earned his diploma. <laughs> We will return.
return in just a moment to tonight's file, which shows how your FBI promotes national security. Now let's hear from a typical American who has attained greater personal security thanks to his employer's cooperation and the equitable society. You know, Mr. Cross, I sure get the breaks. The company I work for has given us all complete group insurance protection. Yes, you really are lucky. Complete group insurance includes life insurance, accident and sickness insurance, and a retirement income, plus hospital, medical, and surgical benefits for yourself and your wife and children, all in one package from the Equitable Life Assurance Society without any medical examination. That's hard to believe. And you know, it hardly cost me anything. That's right. Your employer helps to foot the bill so you and your fellow employees can get this complete protection at what amounts to a wholesale price. Last summer, one of our men was on his vacation and he got killed in an auto accident. Well, our Equitable Society plan covers 24 hours a day wherever you are. And since it was an accident, our group plan pays him double. This fellow's widow is going to keep on getting his paycheck every month for more than two years. You know, group insurance was originated by the Equitable Life Assurance Society in 1911. Thomas I. Parkinson, president of the Equitable Society, says group insurance is the most inspiring life insurance development of our time. If your company does not have group insurance, or if your company's group program is incomplete, your management can get in touch with the nearest Equitable Life Assurance Society office. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. The Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. And now, back to the FBI file, The Big Shakedown. It is safe to say that every prisoner in jail in the United States would rather be a free man than remain behind bars. And yet, there are 25,000 people arrested every month in this country who have already been convicted of a previous crime. Those are the criminals who will submit to any indignity except going to work. Those are the criminals who think they have learned enough about crime to succeed, for they have a plan. But as tonight's case from the files of your FBI proves, society also has a plan. A plan called law and order that invariably defeats them. <laughs> Tonight's file continues at the home of the extortion victim, William Graham. FBI agent Jim Taylor has been brought there by Graham's wife. Mr. Graham. Yes? I don't think you should blame your wife for what she's done. Frankly, my only regret is that she didn't come to us sooner. Now, you say you've paid the money. Yes. Oh, William. Well, I, I was frantic, Martha. I didn't see any other way out. You're still not out, Mr. Graham. Oh, what do you mean? It's my guess that you've only bought yourself temporary relief. Don't forget the extortioner still has that information about your father. If he follows a pattern, as all of them do, this money was only a down payment. But he gave his word in the letter. Mr. Graham, criminal's word is hardly a guarantee. Uh, William, this man you gave the money to, did you see him? No. Well, we have a line on him anyway. What? How? When Mrs. Graham first brought the letter you received to my office, I had it sent to the laboratory to be examined. Yes. There are a number of fingerprints on it, and one set checked with some prints in our criminal files. They belong to a man named Pelly, Chick Pelly. He was released from state's prison just a few weeks ago. I see. We put out a general alarm on him this morning. That's wonderful. So you see, Mr. Graham, in spite of everything, you still might get your money back. I'll get it. Hello? Yes. Yes, he is. Just a moment, please. It's for you, Mr. Taylor. Oh. Oh, thank you. Here you are. Thanks. Hello. Oh, yes, Bob. Yes. Yes, I see. No. No, I'll meet you back at the office, Bob. Yeah. Bye. 
Well, I'm afraid I was too optimistic. What do you mean? The police found the body of Chick Pelly an hour ago in a vacant lot. George, are you going to sleep all day? I'm awake, dear. I'm just resting. What time did you get in? It's after three. Get rid of the body? Yes. I deposited him gently in a vacant lot. Well, we'd better start making plans then, hadn't we? For what? For getting out of here. Darling, there's no heat on us. Well, look, I want to go someplace where there is heat. The kind the sun makes. I want to go to Florida. Uh, not just yet, Grace. But you said... I know that we'd make a score and take a vacation, but I've changed my mind. But why? Well, I'm a greedy fellow. I can't resist one more little bite, especially when it looks so easy. What do you mean? Our victim, Mr. Graham. He paid so easily, I think he's good for another contribution. Now, look, George. I have a foolproof way of collecting from him, darling. After he kicks in the second time, we'll do Florida for the entire season. Come right into the living room, Mr. Taylor. Thank you, Mrs. Graham. Uh, William? Yes, dear? Mr. Taylor's here. Oh, good. I came right over as soon as I got your call. I've received another letter. Well, unfortunately, I thought you would. It came in this morning's mail. May I see it, please? Yes, uh, here you are. They Thank want you. another $10,000. Yes, I see. Well, they've used a different technique. Cut the words from a newspaper and pasted them on the stationery. But the demand is the same. Mm. What about this man, Pelly, that was murdered? Well, the police have no leads on the killer as yet. But I'm convinced that he was just a stooge in this setup anyway. Why? Well, I went over his record. He wasn't smart enough to practice extortion. There was someone behind him. The same someone who sent this letter? I would presume so, yes. What shall I do? Follow the instructions. Take an ad in the paper as they request. Then we'll wait for another letter. Mr. Taylor, yes. I hope you don't mind my barging oh. into your office like this. Not at all, Mr. Graham. Any news? Yes, the letter just came. Here it is. Oh, thanks. They figured out a very clever way for me to pass on the money. Huh? I'm instructed to go out Highway 17 until I come to the bridge that crosses Little Bend River. Yes, yes I see that. They s then they say I should put the money in a waterproof container, mm -hmm. lash it around a log, and send the log downstream. This is clever. As I recall it, there's a ten-mile stretch downstream of complete wilderness. Or they could pick that log up any place along the way. I know. What's our next move? Well, I see you're instructed to do this at 7 o'clock tomorrow morning. Yes. Well, do as they say, uh, except don't use money. We'll take over from there. Car 6, come in. Car 6, come in. This is Car 6. Hello, Jim. Nothing to report. I can see you up there. What's your altitude? About 1,500 feet. Hey, can you still see the log? Yes, I have my glasses on it. It's about three miles below the bridge. I can't see you, though. I'm driving south on Route 17. Any sign of life along the riverbank? No, I can't spot any. I'll contact the other cars now. I'll be back with you later. Right. Now let's get this thing out in the water. How'd you know there'd be a boat here? Because I put it here yesterday. Yeah. I rented it from a boathouse. There. Now, where are the oars? Uh, right here. Oh, fine. I hope the log hasn't gone by. It hasn't. What makes you so sure? Darling, when I plan something, I plan it well. Remember? I learned that this stream travels at the rate of three miles an hour. If you drop the log at exactly seven o'clock, it won't appear here for another ten minutes. Okay, okay. Now just get in the boat and we'll wait. <laughs> Oh, 
Car six, come in. This is car six. I may have something, Jim. What is it? Two people in a rowboat. A man and a woman have just put out from shore, a few hundred feet below the log. Where are you? On Route 17, exactly, exactly three miles south of Centerville. There's a dirt road a mile ahead of you on the left. It cuts right through to the river. It comes out just about where they are. Right. The people in the boat are picking up the log. Better step on it, Jim. <laughs> Well, is the money there? Still trying to open this thing. Can I help? Uh, no, I, I, I've got it. Why the... What's the matter? Paper. There's nothing here but bundles of paper. What? We're heading for shore, quick. What for? If he were smart enough to put paper in there, then he was smart enough to tip off the police. We're getting back to the car fast. Yeah, I thought this one was cool. Oh, no, shut up. Coming into the bank. I know, I know. Well, hey, aren't you going to wait for me? Well, hurry. Give me a hand, will you? Just jump out. Thanks. Now, come on. Where to? We're heading for the car. Oh, no, you're not. What? Who are you? I'm a special agent of the FBI. George. What are you doing here? I wanted to make sure you were collecting that package. There wasn't even any dough in it. I know. Where you're going, you won't need it. George Lawton was turned over to the local authorities and received the sentence of first-degree murder. For her complicity in the murder, Grace Lawton is now serving a long term in the state penitentiary. Tonight's case history from the files of your FBI proves again a point which criminals have always refused to observe. There is no such thing as the perfect crime. There is no crime so well planned that not a single telltale clue is left. There is no refuge so distant that the eyes of the law cannot reach. There's an increase in the number of crimes being committed today but there is a similar increase in the number of arrests being made. No law enforcement agency can prevent crimes from being committed. But of this you may be certain. When crimes are committed, the criminals will be arrested. So long as there is a police officer on your corner. So long as there is your FBI. <laughs> In just a moment, we'll tell you about next week's exciting case from the official files of your FBI. Now, one last word to business executives. Since group insurance was originated by the Equitable Life Assurance Society 35 years ago, thousands of employers have learned that group insurance means satisfied workers, builds loyalty and morale, decreases labor turnover, improves quality and quantity of production. Get all the facts and figures from an Equitable Society group insurance expert. Whether your employees are entirely uninsured or have only partial protection, get in touch with the nearest office or write direct to the New York home office of the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will bring you another colorful story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, The Honest Embezzler. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. Your narrator was Dean Carlton. This is your FBI is written and produced by Jerry Devine. This is Milton Cross speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community 
and inviting you to tune in again next week at the same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States will bring you another thrilling story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The Honest Embezzler on This Is Your FBI. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This is Your FBI. This is Your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. <laughs> Fathers and mothers of America, upon the training you give your children today depends the future of America. Our system of free enterprise, personal liberty and democracy cannot exist without educated and enlightened citizens. In about 14 minutes, our sponsor, the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States, will have some helpful suggestions for parents. If you wish to equip your children to take advantage of all the opportunities the future offers, don't miss this important message. Tonight's FBI file, the Sugar Swindler. Every year in every state in the Union, Americans are swindled out of millions of dollars by confidence men. And it appears from the current files of your FBI that 1946 will prove to be no exception. There are just enough among us in both high and low estates who are looking for something for nothing. And because of that, confidence men never lack a ready market. Indeed, no axiom was ever truer than the motto of the swindler. The motto he uses as a yardstick when measuring potential victims. That axiom is, you can't cheat a careful man who checks before he acts. Tonight's file opens in a small apartment located in a residential section of an eastern city. It is early evening. The occupants of this modest flat, a newly married couple named Martin, are entertaining a dinner guest. Mr. Hanover? Uh, yes, my dear? Would you like another piece of cake? Indeed I would, young lady. It's simply delicious. Oh, really? I, I could give you the recipe if you'd like it. Well, I... Uh... She's recipe happy, Mr. Hanover. She thinks everyone should collect them. Oh, okay. now, Eddie. <laughs> it's a fact. You clip out everyone you see. Why, she's got books full of them. Well, if they all turn out like this, you should consider yourself a very fortunate young man. Oh, gee, that's so nice to hear. You know something, Mr. Hanover? Yes? I can tell you now. I I was awful nervous about you coming here to dinner. Nervous? Well, why? Well, Eddie told me all about you. What a successful man you are. I was just scared. Oh, that's ridiculous. Oh, I couldn't help it, especially when I knew you were coming here tonight to talk to Eddie about his going to work for you. Kay. Well, that's what you told me, wasn't it? Look, Mr. Hanover, all I said was that you looked me up when you came into town because you'd heard I knew something about the business. But, Eddie, I... Now, 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 just a minute, both of you. There's been no harm done. As a matter of fact, I'm quite anxious to talk to Eddie about his working for me. Really? Uh, yes. So perhaps you can tell me something about your past experience, uh, what you've done? Well, I've stolen about a half a dozen cars. Yes. Stuck up a couple of grocery stores. Mm hmm Rolled a few drunks. And don't forget to tell about the checks, Eddie. Oh, yes, I've I've kited some checks. Any police record? Oh, no, no. Oh, he's really been very careful, Mr. Hanover. Well, that's a fairly diversified background, but uh, to be frank with you, I'm rather disappointed. Oh, goodness, why? A man with your husband's appearance, manner, speech, uh, should be operating on a much higher level, my dear. Well, for heaven's sakes, he's just getting started. I think for the length of time he's been in the business, he's made wonderful strides. Kay, please. Well, I mean it. Look. Mr. Hanover, 
What sort of man did you have in mind? Well, um, I'll give you a brief sketch of the operation I'm planning here. I think that'll explain everything. Okay. When I arrived in town, I secured guest privileges at the Fairhaven Club. I'm uh, living there. Oh, is that the swanky place out in Lake Road? Uh, yes. Most of the club members are very wealthy businessmen. And businessmen these days are in a great deal of trouble with shortages. Oh. I circulate around the club until I find one individual who is so annoyed at the shortages that he's willing to go to any length to get what he needs. You mean an honest guy with just a little touch of larceny, huh? Exactly. And I'm happy to say that I have found such a gentleman. Oh, gee, you work fast. His name is Bristol. He's in the candy business and greatly in need of sugar. Which you, of course, will get for him. Uh, naturally. Well, that's just the preamble. The rest is quite intricate. I uh, won't touch on it now. Gee, I've always wanted Eddie to get into something high class like that. Little lady, I think your wish can be granted. You mean you want him to work for you? Yes, oh. I think he will qualify. Thanks, Mr. Hanover. I have an engagement tomorrow to play croquet with Mr. Bristol at the club. I hope to put the hooks into the old boy then. If I am successful... Your new career begins. Good shot, Mr. Bristol. Right through both wickets. Just lucky, that's all. Nothing of the sort. I've been watching that swing of yours. You play a slashing game. Uh, get out here often, do you? Every day. Well, no wonder. I've got nothing else to do. No use going to the office. Uh, why not? Can't get the stuff to make anything with. Uh, what is your business, Mr. Bristol? Candy. Well, what's your problem? Sugar. Can't get any. Well, that's too bad. <coughs> well played. Thank you. I suppose, Mr. Bristol, you've been approached like all of us have on undercover propositions? What do you mean? Uh, being offered, uh, say, sugar by an illegitimate source? No, no, I haven't. Well, you're lucky. I've been bothered to death by them. Uh, just got a letter this morning, as a matter of fact. What about? Uh, from an old employee of mine who went into the army. Uh, still in, as a matter of fact. He's the captain in the quartermaster corps. Yes? Uh, well, here's the letter right here. He's listed a hundred items that he can get for me. Well, how? He's stealing them from the army. How else? Now, my first inclination was to report him. Then I decided, why become involved in some long, drawn-out mess? So, uh, I'm just forgetting about it. What are you doing? Tearing up the letter. There. Uh, you're shot, Mr. Bristol. Do you think a fellow like that can deliver? I know he can. Well, how? I know some people who already done business with him. Frankly... I think it's pretty awful. Oh, of course, of course. Probably even had sugar on his list, huh? Uh, yes, he did. I noticed it. Surely you weren't interested, Mr. Bristol. I should say not. Bully for you. Uh, make your shot. Very well. Oh, that was a pippin. <laughs> Mr. Hanover. Yes, my dear. Don't you think that Eddie should be getting home here soon? Now, just relax, child. I'm sure that everything is going fine. I hope so. Well, if you'd seen how anxious Mr. Bristol was to do business, there'd be no doubt in your mind. I wish I could get something straight in my head. Oh, yes? Well, uh, what's that? Why did Eddie have to wear that captain's uniform? I'll try to explain it once more. Mr. Bristol thinks that Eddie is a captain in the army. How did he know to call Eddie here? Because this phone number was in that letter. But you said you tore the letter up. I did. But Bristol went back there after our game was over and picked up the pieces. Oh. Yes. <laughs> I wish you could have seen him last night, my dear. On his hands and knees in the dusk, lighting matches to find the missing pieces. <laughs> Do you think he'll really believe that Eddie can get him sugar? I'm positive. Good. Well, I guess I'll read some more recipes. Would you like to read some, too, Mr. Hanover? Not at the moment. Oh. Tell me, my dear. Yes? Were you ever in the profession? Oh, not really. I just did a little shoplifting. I wasn't good at it. I'd rather just stay home and be a housewife. I see. Is that you, Eddie? Yes, honey. 
Oh, gee, I'm glad you're here. I was awful worried. Well, there was nothing to worry about. Well, how did it go, son? Just fine, Mr. Hanover. Good. It all came off just as we planned. When did you promise him delivery? I said sometime around the end of the week. Did you agree on a price? Yes. $5,000. Splendid. Say, I just thought, where are you going to get the sugar? From a sand pit, my dear? Huh? Honey, the bags we deliver will be loaded with sand. Oh, gee. He won't be able to make much candy with that. Some two miles away from the Martins' apartment at the local field office of the FBI, Charles Hanover is also the center of attention. Could you tell me where I could find a Mr. Tom Walters? Why, I'm... Why, Jim Taylor, you old (laughs) son of a gun, how are you? Hello, Tom. When did you get in town? About an hour ago. You been assigned to this office? No, I'm on a traveling job. What's it about? Well, I just told the whole story to your agent in charge, and believe me, it doesn't make me a hero. Trouble, Jim? Complete and utter frustration. I've spent the last month being just one jump behind one of the cleverest swindlers in the business. Who is he? Well, he has about ten aliases. Harris, Howell, Hartford, you just take your pick. What's his pattern of operation, Jim? It's just the trouble. He has no set pattern. He's been using as many swindles as he has names. Now, most of them have been local police cases, but the last two fell within our jurisdiction. I see. There's only one consistent thing that he does. And what's that? He always double-crosses his confederates. He uses new ones on each job. Have you picked any of them up? Oh, yes, but that's never led us to the top. Do you think he's here in town? That's highly possible, yes. What's your lead? Well, he bought a plane ticket for here a week ago. I just uncovered that this morning. Well, Jim, if there's anything I can do to help, why, you know... I think there is, Tom. You've been assigned to the case. Really? Mm Mm-hmm. Oh, that's good. What's our first move? I think we should check all hotels, tourist camps, and rooming houses and give them the swindler's description. We have a good one on him. Does he work on any particular type of victim? Yes, businessmen usually. So let's say you alert the Better Business Bureau, too. Right. And look, Tom... I've struck out twice against this old boy. This time, I want to get a hit. Kay. Kay. Yes, Eddie? Haven't you finished packing yet? Everything but my recipes. Oh, now look, honey, you can't take all of them. We wouldn't have room for anything else. Oh, but I went to so much trouble getting them. Oh, come on, just take your favorites, huh? Mr. Hanover said we should be ready to move out of here this afternoon. I know. Eddie. Yes, hon? Did Mr. Hanover ever say how much he was paying you for this job? I know. Why? Well, it just seems to me that you're being just as smart in this thing as he is. (laughs) Yes, but it was his idea. But if anything went wrong, you'd be the one who'd be in trouble. Oh, he'll give us a good deal. I'm not worried. He wants us to travel along with him, doesn't he? That must mean he's satisfied. Yes. I'll get it. Hello. Edward? Oh, hello, Mr. Hanover. Everything's set, my boy. Good. I've loaded all the sandbags into that vacant store on Front Street. Yes? I want you to call Mr. Bristol and have you meet him there no later than 3 o'clock. Yes, sir. Show him the bags, collect the 5000 and be sure he brings it in cash. Then give him the keys to the store and uh, blow. Where do I meet you? I've engaged a compartment for us on the 4 o'clock train to Pittsburgh. Meet me aboard the train with the money. What about the railroad tickets? I'll have your lovely bride pick them up at the station. They're in your name. Car 162, compartment D. Car 162, compartment D. Right. Are you all packed? Just about. Well, good luck, my boy, and good hunting. Oh. Oh, honey, I thought you'd never come. How'd everything go? Not a hitch. Got the money? Here it is, baby. Five G's. Gosh. Where's Mr. Hanover? I don't know, but you know what, Eddie? What? There's something funny going on about him. What do you mean? Well, I called the club where he was staying at just before I picked up the train tickets. Uh Uh-huh. Now, I was anxious to know if he'd heard anything about you. Yes? They told me that he'd checked out and gone to the airport. The airport? Yes. They said he'd send his baggage out there, too. You sure? I'm positive. And that isn't all. 
Well? When I picked up the tickets for this compartment, I asked if Mr. Hanover had ordered one for himself, and they said no. Say, that is funny. I- I've got a feeling he's trying to pull something. <laughs> now, look, what could he pull? I've got the money. Just the same, I've got a feeling. Oh, a woman's feeling. After all, just because he's a big shot crook, that doesn't say he's an honest man. Okay, I think... Yes? Open up, my boy. Oh, okay. Hi, Mr. Hanover. Well, I'm delighted to see that you're here safe and sound. I trust everything worked out well. I've got the money right here. Splendid, splendid. Uh, let me have it, please. Mr. Hanover, where are your bags? Bags? Why, I gave them to a porter. Uh, they should be right along. Uh, let me have that money, son. I've got to go back in the station and wire a few hundred to a friend in distress before the train leaves. Don't you give it to him, Eddie. What is this? I've just got a feeling that if you leave this train with that money, you're not coming back. Now, my dear child, where would I go? To the airport. Airport? What for? Because that's where your bags are. Now, look, I have had enough of this nonsense. Give me that money. I'll give you your share of it. What? Don't you give him more than half, Eddie. I'm taking it all. Let go of that leave money. Leave him alone. Oh, no, no. Very well, then. Wait a minute. Put down that water just, jug. Just what I'm going to do. <sighs> now, Eddie, I think we'd better leave him here, and we'll go to the airport. <laughs> We will return in just a moment to tonight's FBI file. Now, three questions and answers on education. First question. What are the future employment prospects for young men with engineering training? In some branches of engineering, it is true the supply of war-trained men is ample for some years to come. But in chemical engineering, electrical engineering, metallurgical and mining engineering, surveys show that there are plenty of opportunities for ambitious young men. On what are these forecasts based? They come from a memorandum recently prepared for Equitable Society representatives. This memorandum, covering 29 different industries and professions, was designed as a guide to parents who want to provide for their children's futures through an equitable educational fund. Second question. What is an equitable educational fund? It is a life insurance plan that includes these important features. The Equitable Educational Fund Make sure that money for education will be ready when your child is ready. If you die, the educational fund becomes fully established. If you are totally or permanently disabled, the educational fund continues to build up without any further payment. Educational costs are spread out over many years instead of being concentrated in a few. Last question. How much will it cost to send your son or daughter to college? That question is answered in a memorandum recently prepared for Equitable Society representatives. It tells the cost of tuition, board, and lodging in 192 leading American colleges. It summarizes the long-range opportunities in 29 industries and professions, such as architecture, dentistry, engineering, chemistry, life insurance, social service, information that every parent should have. Your nearest Equitable Society representative will be glad to show his copy to any sincerely interested parent. Get in touch with him tomorrow or call the nearest Equitable Life Assurance Society office. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. The Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. And now, back to the FBI file, The Sugar Swindler. With easy money flooding the American scene, swindlers are doing a bigger business than ever before. And their victims, as they have always been, are those whose greed overcomes their conscience. When there are human beings without greed, there will be no swindlers. But until that time, it's the business of your FBI to protect the American public from these unscrupulous criminals. Tonight's file continues in the local field office of the FBI. 
Special Agents Taylor and Walters have been listening for some time to the testimony of the irate and indignant victim, Mr. Bristol. And so, gentlemen, I place the entire matter in your hands. I want these men apprehended, and I want my money returned. Mr. Bristol. Yes? I gather from what you've told us that when you made this deal with the bogus army captain, you were fully aware that this alleged sugar that you were buying was being stolen from the United States Army. I didn't question where it was coming from. But you must have assumed that it was government property. I don't see what that has to do with getting my money back. It has nothing to do with it. But in my opinion, you deserve to lose it. Now see here, I don't... That, however, is purely a personal opinion. It is still the duty of the FBI to recover that $5,000 and apprehend the criminals. Oh, Jim. Yes, Tom. From the description of this man Hanover, I would certainly think he was the man you came here to find. There's no doubt about that. Mr. Bristol, you say this man was a guest at your club? He was living there, yes, but I told you he's already checked out. Tom, will you call the club, see if they have any further information on him, please? Right. Thanks. Sand. $5,000 worth of sand. Mr. Bristol, you say you telephoned the bogus captain? That's right. Where did you get that phone number? It was in a letter that Mr. Hanover... that he gave me to read. I see. Was there anyone else in on the deal? No one that I met. But when I first called the captain, the young woman answered the phone. Well, may I have that number, please? Yes, yes, I've, I've got it right here. There you are. Thank you. I will have this traced and get the address. 